today. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the privilege that we have to be here this Sunday morning and to share your word, to be a part of what you're doing in all of our lives. We thank you for your presence in our lives and your guidance and direction. And this morning, I know that there's people here from all walks and ways of life, and we're at different places in life, challenges uh, that uh, for some are extensive and difficult and for others and maybe less so of a place but your word is there for each of us uh, to feed us and to guide and direct us from where we are today and we ask for that in Jesus name amen all right well again there's a couple of just my uh, small side comments I want to make to you people may doubt what you say but they will believe what you do correct our world, and in particular America, but it's not limited to America for sure, people say a lot of things. In the world of religion, politics, uh, entertainment, it doesn't matter. They say a lot of stuff. Most of the time you know they're not telling the truth, but they'll believe what you do. And another one that uh, I, I don't know, in the old days we'd probably call it catty, but it, God loves a cheerful giver. The Bible says that, right? God loves a cheerful giver but he will accept money from a grouch. <laughs> so, appreciate it. But yes, you are a generous church, and we try, very rarely do we take a second offering, but every year we take an offering for the Olson family, and we are about 90% of their support all these 20 years, so you've been an amazing church for them. So let's get into our message today. Our text is from Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. You saw a very interesting portrayal of that in the video a while ago. I could only hear half of the words from up here, but it looked cute. Um, I'm going to go back into the more traditional biblical account today, if that's all right with you. Uh, but everywhere you look today, it does look a lot like Christmas. Christmas is no doubt... Uh, a special time of the year of all the 12 months and the various seasons. This is a time of the year when the decorations are plentiful and the songs of joy to the world and peace on earth and goodwill to men and just a, a, a higher uh, lifting of spirits that takes place in the time of the Christmas season. For us as Christians, there's a deep meaning for the, the Christmas season. Uh, but those who are not believers, uh, we have to acknowledge still gets into the festivities of the Christmas season, the cultural side of it, and uh, there's a lot of excitement, and we know that the Christmas season and the Christmas story not only has a lot of excitement, but it has miracles involved in it. Uh, many of us had the privilege of listening to Andy Williams with one of the smoothest voices you'd ever hear when he sang so long ago, it's beginning uh, not only to look a lot like Christmas, but he was most known for it's the most uh, beautiful time or wonderful time of the year. And uh, we had the privilege because in his older years, he went to Branson, Missouri, not far from Joplin, and had his theater there and did a lot of performances there before his passing. Great singer, great songs. But today's message is what do you do at a Christmas time when things aren't going so well for you? Because that is the reality of life. Christmas time is not just a time of celebration for everyone. Christmas time for some people is a very difficult time. Not related to Christmas per se, but the time of the year um, has not uh, derailed the difficulties that they're experiencing in life. People die during the Christmas season. Uh, I actually have this mentioned later in the notes, but yesterday was the 32nd anniversary of my mother's death. She died on December 16th, 32 years ago, and I came out here six months later, so I've been here 31 and a half years. Uh, Pastor Miller uh, over our school was in Florida for business, but one of those days happened to be, which was the 14th, the first anniversary of his mother's death, and he was there at that location in the beach where they wintered and uh, spent time, a very emotional time for him. Um, and so last year it was a hard Christmas for their family as well. Serious illnesses, divorces occur. Uh, Derek and Tess, our son and daughter-in-law, moved into their house yesterday, a result of a divorce. Uh, so those people are going through difficult times at Christmas. Um, uh, they bought that home, make sure I made that clear, they bought the home from people who are getting a divorce. Uh, joblessness broken relationships, there's all kinds of stuff that go on while 
many people are more lighthearted and fest festive in their spirits during the Christmas holidays. But what if bad things are happening in your life? How do you deal with that? Um, and there's a real issue there for people. Christmas time can be really hard for a lot of people, um, and it's not always a festive time for them. We know that suicides go up in the month of December as the holidays bring to the forefront the difficulties and the tragedies, the struggles, the problems that people are having in their life. Uh, we won't digress into a di discussion of that, but that is just documented. It's a fact. Uh, people seem at this time of the year to see the lightheartedness and the happiness in others' lives, uh, internalize their struggles and their problems at such a depth that the headaches seem uh, just uh, to come to the surface and, and it's too much for them to bear. They often feel more alone and isolated than at any other time of the year. It's a, it's a very difficult time for them and to be overwhelmed and as Marcia and I talked the other day, uh, in fact I think it was yesterday about this subject and how that as people just lose hope. It's, it's hard, to, hard to see if you haven't been through it with people, but, but it happens. And while the Christmas account gives the miracles that we discussed last week in the message, it also includes the struggles, which is what we're going to talk about this week. While Mary was experiencing the miracles, which was just fascinating, and again, we covered it last week, Joseph, on the other hand, was struggling big time. And you're going to see that today in the message. His fiance is pregnant. He's not the father. Never a good situation. There's public ridicule. There's financial support now for a child. And all of these other things. And Joseph is struggling big time. Now the Bible doesn't say very much about Joseph. But we get a glimpse of him in our text today. And from that glimpse we can see a lot of what to do when Christmas is filled with heartache in your life. So let's read our text in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. Now, I know you've all heard it, but I think you're going to see some things that will help you today, and especially if you're going through a hard time. So let's read the entirety of the text, verse 18 to 25, Matthew chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, now notice he's her husband. They're legally married. But they haven't had sex yet, and I'll explain that in a moment. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. What a wonderful guy. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. They were married, so he's thinking, okay, my wife has been unfaithful. I'm going to divorce her, but I'm going to do it quietly for her sake. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate. That means they didn't have sex. He did not, they, uh, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, there are three encouragements from this story. Uh, that we can learn because Joseph was hurting. He was struggling. And uh, we learn from him uh, what he was going through. So let me give them to you this morning. Number one, don't live in denial. If you're here today and your world is being rocked, one of the most important lessons we learn from Joseph is to not live in denial. Reading verse 18 and 19 again, just quickly. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now you see here from these two verses, 
that Joseph and Mary were considered married in Jewish law. That's why he sought to divorce her quietly. They were already legally married. They had a marriage contract. But as was custom in their day, for various reasons, one of which was uh, to make sure that the bride was not already pregnant, they withheld from sexual contact for 6 to 12 months. Don't care to go into any more of that. You just should understand that peculiarity versus our culture today. There was actually very little interaction during this period of time with the uh, husband and wife, even though they were legally married, until they reached the, the term. At some point, Mary comes to Joseph and she says, Joseph, I'm pregnant. That is tough to say to your husband when you and he both knows he's not the father, right? Being a gentleman, he sought to divorce her quietly, and there's no question that Joseph asked her, Mary, what have you done? How could you have done this? And because Nazareth was a small community, very small community, a backwater community, Joseph probably said, who's the father? There's only 25 guys in this village. Who's the father, Mary? Joseph is crushed. This just doesn't happen in their culture. And certainly not with God-fearing people. How could this be? His heart is crushed. He has prepared and moved forward and legally married the woman of his dreams. And before they even come together as man and wife per se, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Mary says, no, no, Joseph, Joseph, I'm pregnant, but I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. I'm still a virgin. And Joseph is like, okay, I haven't been to the University of Jerusalem, but I'm not stupid, Mary. <laughs> Joseph is stunned at the news of his pregnancy, and now he believes that she's lying to him on top of it. It's bad enough that you've done something, Mary, but now you're lying. And not only lying, what kind of a whopper story is this? No one would have believed Mary. No one blames Joseph for not believing Mary. Joseph is struggling. He's hurting. It isn't that he's struggling or hurting that's such a big story. It's how he handled it is why I'm sharing it with you today. If you're struggling here today, it's important that you don't act like you're not hurting. It's okay to hurt. If you've gone through or are going through any of these things I've talked to you about, any of us who have gone through anything similar to what you've gone through knows the crushingness of those experiences, or at least how they can be crushing, life-altering, shaking you at your core, requiring that the faith in God and Christ that you have is the only thing holding you steady, for which we are grateful for sure. But it doesn't mean that you're some kind of a weak, pitiful little Christian just because you're hurting and you're struggling. In fact, with all due respect, the Bible couldn't be more clear if you take the time to actually study it instead of building your Christian faith around cliches or flippant comments or slogans in Christendom. If you really look at the scripture, you'll find that the Bible, that God is very aware of the trials that you're going through, and he has answers for you, but it's dealt in the area of reality. The first thing we learned about Joseph is don't live in denial. It's terrible. There's no question about that, but you can't live in denial. Look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 26, verse 37 and 38. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to go to the cross. Most of us know this, but let's look at it in context of what we're talking about today. It's in verse 37 and 38, Matthew 26. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. When you go through divorce, when you're fighting cancer, when your finances is gone, you're, you've lost your job, you've got a serious illness or a relationship that means everything to you has been destroyed, 
you find yourself sorrowful and troubled, and so did the Lord. And in verse 38, I find this to be comforting. Then he said to them, this is the Lord, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. The complexities of the Godhead of Christ and the humanness of Christ has always been an interesting debate. But the Bible couldn't be more clear that Jesus took upon him the form of man and became a man just like you and I, a human, like you and I. I don't want to make the feminist mad in this world today. And he understands the problems that we go through. And this was a real physical and emotional process that he went through to go to the cross to die for our sins. You know that he said to the Father in the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. I'm getting an awful feedback and a loudness up here. If you might want to turn it down, I don't know. Thank you. That's better. Jesus knows what it's like for your spirit to be crushed. If you go back to the Old Testament, to the prophecies concerning uh, the Messiah, uh, in, let's see, let's go to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 3, just a quick verse there, talking about the Messiah, Jesus. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. I'm not talking about just being frustrated, angry, and aggravated, and put out with somebody. I'm talking about a pain that pierces your soul, a crushing of your spirit that makes it hard for you to breathe, and even to process minute by minute, hour by hour, and day by day, the depth of the tearing that's going on in your heart. You look at Jesus and what he went through, what did he feel? When Peter, after these three and a half years with him, denied him three times. What was he feeling when Judas, after that same three and a half years, betrayed him? And we know that David was one of the greatest uh, lovers of God of all time. The scriptures couldn't be more plain that David loved God. The Bible says he had a heart that followed after God. And David says this in Psalm uh, 38. Hang on a second. I got the wrong one here. Let me back over. Psalm 38 and verse number 8. Now, keeping in mind, this is an awesome guy, but he says, I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. I don't need you to raise your hands this morning, but if you've been where David was, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When that doctor looks at you and tells you you have cancer and that you can give it a good fight, but it's going to get you in the end, that's tough. When that spouse walks out on you, especially if you didn't see it coming, regardless of the circumstances, that's tough. When you sit there and look at a little five, six, seven-year-old, doesn't get any easier when they're teenagers either. But when you look at those five, six, seven, eight years old and you tell them daddy's not coming back or mama's not coming back, I'm telling you those are hard conversations to have. And your heart is crushed. David said, I want you to know, God, I'm feeble and I'm utterly crushed and I groan in anguish of heart. David's life is well written in Scripture. You can read it for yourself. But he was, he was as he described it there. Now, Joseph is hurting, even though Joseph, what he believed about Mary was not true. In your notes, there's a statement there, it's okay to hurt, but it's not okay to retaliate. This is very important. It's okay to hurt, but it's not okay to retaliate. In divorce care, this is something we teach people that this isn't good. But all of that comes from biblical teaching to boot. Because it's not okay to retaliate, because the scriptures teach us that, and because David or because Joseph was such a high character man, and, and a, I would suggest from scriptures, 
probably a very gentle soul. I don't know that for sure, but I'm guessing that from his behavior. But he sought to divorce her quietly. He did not want to retaliate against her. He did not want to make her a public spectacle. He did not want to go screaming, look, I had nothing to do with this, this fill in the blanks. He didn't try to make himself look better at her expense. He said, in his mind, I'm just going to go and divorce her quietly and probably try to help her figure out the rest of her life. But we're not going to get married, or we're not going to stay married, if you please, and join his husbands and wife. So just a side note, I wonder if there's anyone here today that are hurt because you believe something that someone else has said or done that, in fact, they have not said or done. You think they've lied or done something or said something or you've misinterpreted their words or their actions and it has separated the relationship. Be careful. Joseph was sure that Mary was unfaithful and on top of that lying to him and he was struggling. But I'm going to move on to point two, but I want you to get this because it's so important. Do not live in denial. Joseph was dealing with his pregnant wife as best he could in all honesty. Understand that Christianity has always had a carved out element of it that is a blend of truth and error. We have every reason to have faith in God and every reason to place our life in His hands. That's what we do and rightly so. But if you study the Scriptures, there is absolutely no place in Scripture where we are told to deny the realities of life. What we are told is to take our realities to a God who can do the impossible. And I don't care, and there's not a person here much older than me, and I've been preaching since I was 16. And I know the Bible well, and I know preachers well. I know the national preachers, the television preachers, and I know what they say versus what the Word of God says, whether it be true or not. There is nowhere in your Bible that you are to deny in the name of faith the realities that you're walking in. We are to take our realities to a God that we know has the power to move the mountains in our lives. He has the power to bring peace in our turmoil. He has the power to redirect us to where we will be what he wants us to be in the midst of our worst hurt. That is what the Bible says about God. It does not say deny that you're divorced. It does not say deny that you have cancer. It does not say deny that you've been a jerk. It says own up to it and take it to God. And somebody says, our man or you can go to another church but the damage and the damnation that is done in people's lives when things don't go their way and someone says if you only had enough faith you would be healed if you only had enough faith God would save your marriage I got news for you people I know that are the finest Christians I've ever met have gone through hell had their butts burned but God brought them through it don't put that kind of non-biblical pressure on people. God didn't do it, and you're damnable for doing it to others. The first lesson we learn of Joseph is don't live in denial. Was he wrong about the facts? Yes, he was. But as far as he knew, especially in his world, his wife was pregnant, and he wasn't the father. And so he went to God, and he said, and you're going to see that. Well, let's just go to it. Let's go to point number two. The second encouragement. Keep your heart soft and tender so you can hear from God. In Joseph's case, it's true that what Mary said was true. But Joseph doesn't know that. In his world, his wife is pregnant by someone else. Not him. And in verse 20 and 21 of our text, Stay with me. Sorry to yell at you this morning, but I get irritated at people who misuse God's word and God's name. Yeah, I do. And if you've ever been crushed, if you've ever been through this, you know what it's like when some self-righteous biblical don't know what they think they know comes up to you and starts pouring a bunch of acid in the name of Jesus into your life. 
It isn't a joke, my friends. Maybe you're here today and life's pretty good and easy and you're just wanting to hear a good sermon and go to McDonald's or something. And that's a good place to be. I like those Sundays too. But every Sunday we stand here and preach the gospel, this house is filled with people whose lives are in a really difficult place and a journey that they'll fight for months if not years. And they're not here just to have another day. They're here, God speak into my life. They're not feeling sorry for themselves. They've come to the house of prayer for the God who is over all things to do something in their life. And so in verse 20 and 21, again it says, But after he considered this, considered to divorce her and all of this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. Now, there's absolutely no doubt that Joseph, being a true man of God, went to God for help as to how to deal with this terrible situation for he and Mary. In our culture today, maybe our younger people don't even see this as that big of a deal. Ah, happens all the time. Yeah, well, you didn't live in Nazareth 2,000 years ago. And when, David, or when Joseph went to God, God spoke to him. I want to tell you, God speaks to those who are listening. Going back to that psalm passage I almost read to you a moment ago. In chapter 62 and verse number 8. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. You get mad at God and shut him out, then who in the world are you going to take all your problems to? I see people do this. The, the world's caved in on them for whatever. And on top of that, they get mad at God and throw him out. Well, now who are you going to go to? You might know this passage. I read it from time to time. I certainly quote it a lot from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Verse 66 and 69. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And then Jesus says this, looking at the 12. says, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12, the 12 disciples. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, there's a great piece of advice to all of us here today. Whatever is difficult for you, whatever is hard for you to go through, whatever you do not understand, whatever you would give your right leg uh, to have it go away, whatever you're going through, the last thing you want to do is to walk away from the Lord. Take your cares to him. He is your answer. He is your comforter. He is the one that will help you through whatever you are facing. And he's the only one who can make sense of your struggle and your hurt as you listen to him. Don't shut God out. Keep your heart soft and tender so you can hear from him. So the question really is, if you're hurting significantly here today especially, are you listening to God? Are you listening for him to speak into your life? 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. I don't have time to go to the whole story, but just that one verse alone. The Lord came and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Speak, for your servant is listening. Joseph worked through all of his anger and his hurt with Mary by seeking out God. Do not deny your current situation. Take it to God. He's waiting for you to do that already. I know this sounds corny, but to illustrate uh, what I was saying a while ago in my first pastor, I was just 25 years old and a young lady who was only in her late 20s with three kids, no husband, and her mother, who was older in years, attended the little church there. And she had terminal cancer, and she was really at the end of the journey for the most part. 
And when I came in as the pastor, the first thing she said was, Pastor, would you pray for me? The doctor said, I have cancer, but I reject that. You hear that in Christendom. You've heard it over the years, and I won't digress any further. But I looked at her, and I said, Ma'am, I'm terribly sorry. I mean, she's only three or four years older than me. I was 25. And I looked at those little kids, but I said, Ma'am, are you asking me to ask God to heal you of something you don't have? Me nor God, either one's that stupid. We have to take to God what we're going through. I remember when the Wilkerson's granddaughter drowned in the river down here. That destroyed, they raised them as their daughter. That destroyed a portion. I mean, it crushed you. Popular cheerleader in one of the big high schools here. I remember the service here and filled with kids, just packed with kids in this building. Their heart was crushed. They were changed forever because of that. They're not like those without hope, but it changes you. It crushes you, and the pain they went through, unless you've been through something like that, you know what I'm talking about. But you can't say, no, I reject this. I won't believe this. It's okay to say I'm having a hard time with this, but you've got to keep your heart soft and tender so that God can speak into your life. And if you're struggling, as this Christmas season is in full throttle, you need to search out God's word too. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Because God, especially through his word, will guide you where you need to walk. I want you to see something very important here. Notice that the angel didn't tell Joseph everything about the future. Joseph believes his fiance is pregnant by another man in the community or someone who might have raped her. He didn't know. She just said, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Well, I mean, she said by the Holy Spirit, but he, he didn't get that. So he's thinking who knows what. But the angel doesn't go through the future. He only takes care of the present need when he talks to Joseph. And he says, Joseph, you take Mary as your wife. Your child is God's son. Well, now, you don't have to be very smart to think, okay, that's a lot. What does that mean for our future? That child is God, you're serious? I'd immediately start having an awful lot of questions. The kids today would probably say, boy, I didn't see that coming. Joseph, God will will tell you what to do. So in your notes there quickly, there's a statement there, as with Joseph, God will give us the next step. He'll tell us what to do. I have done this my entire life, my friends. I'm not a super spiritual giant. The strength in my life, in my humble opinion, the strength in my life has been the simplicity of my faith. Not because I'm not educated. I've got multiple degrees. You can see that. But those came later in life. It's simply because at 12, I accepted Christ into my life, and at 16, started preaching, which the preaching in itself didn't make much difference, but I just believed God, and I was definitive from the time I was 12. In fact, I didn't come to Jesus at 12 because I wanted to sit with a girl in church. I came to Jesus at 12 because I'd been searching the scriptures there, And I believed he was the son of God. And from that moment on, I only wanted to know truth. I've never, ever in any facet of life wanted to deal outside of church. I mean, outside of truth. And church was no different. And I've read the scriptures over and over and over. And I found that the simplicity of faith in trusting God will bring you through a lot of your difficult times. And so back in our text in verse 22 and 23... All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Powerful words. Verse 23 there is a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 
7, verse 14, if you want to read that later. Number three, the third encouragement is to obey God's commands even when it's difficult. This one gets tough. Obey God's commands even when it's difficult. In the text there in verse 24 and 25, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, the Bible is perfectly clear that Mary remained a virgin until Jesus was born. I need you to understand, to help you this morning, that even now knowing God's direction, obeying it, was not going to be easy for Joseph. Please understand that. It wasn't going to be easy to obey God. Okay, fine. You say, well, it ought to be fairly easy when you've had confirmation. An angel comes and tells you this is all true and blah, blah, blah. Well, <clears throat> I've seen uh, a lot of people have the hand of God move on their behalf only to walk away from that blessing and not even bother to thank the Lord for it. And there's even biblical accounts of that as well occurring. Why would it be difficult for Joseph, you say? Stay with me. Why would it be so difficult for Joseph, you say? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there would be questions. Whoa, Joseph, you and Mary's had a baby. You had sex before you were supposed to. Oh, mockers, slanders. Let me read an interesting verse to you. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Listen close. This is interesting. Some of you this bell will come on for the first time, or light. In Mark 6, 3, they say this, Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? Notice this, and they took offense at him. Now, there's a lot of reasons why these people took offense at Jesus. But notice it says in that verse, Mark 6, 3, isn't this Mary's son? And they took offense at him. Why did they say it that way? It wasn't because of the familiarity. Well, he was born here and we know him. He grew up here. He couldn't be the son of God. We've known him since he was born. No, that wasn't the whole story. The whole story was he was a bastard in their eyes. Bastard is not a word used for profanity in technical terms. Some have. The bastard means illegitimate child. So when people said, you bastard, they may be using it as a curse word, but the meaning behind it is you're an illegitimate child. And if you go back to the early days of Pastor Ernie, he's older than me. Often people would actually use that with intention and specificity. Yeah, because that was not a good thing. So they looked at Jesus, and people labeled Mary and Joseph as having sex before they were allowed to. Jesus is born illegitimately, and that he is an illegitimate child. Has no place, respect, or anything in the community. Look how difficult that would have to be for Joseph, Mary, and for that matter, Jesus. To have people always saying and whispering these things. Hey, isn't that the little illegitimate kid Jesus? Stigma that they had to deal with. And even with the tongues wagging, Joseph obeyed God. How difficult. How difficult. Now I'm going to get to something really important here. We need to obey even when it's difficult, painful, and hard. That's what we do because we know our God is faithful. We don't do it flippantly. We do it honestly, just like Joseph did. We don't deny the reality. We take that reality to God. And we wait for God to give us the next step. If we're schooled enough in scriptures, we know that we don't need to ask him for the full picture. God, just give me the step to take today, and I'll trust you for the step that you'll direct me in tomorrow. 
and it's filled with pain, it's filled with uncomfortableness, it's filled with false accusations, it's filled with misunderstandings, it's filled with people who are making it more difficult instead of lighting your load, and yet you take the steps one at a time because that's what the Bible teaches us and God has been faithful to those before you and he'll be faithful to you as well as to those after you. But here's what's very important for those of you that are married, going through the uh, terminal illness of a child, or many other things short of a divorce scenario here. Something very important is Joseph and Mary are now on the same page. And I'll tell you this. It is much easier to do the difficult when everybody's on the same page. Much easier to do the difficult when everybody's on the same page. In your notes, there are two words that will change your life. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. When God speaks, get up and do what he says. I don't know what God's telling you to do that's difficult for you. There could be a whole list of them. But I'm telling you that the words that will change your life is yes, Lord. You know, Marsha and I have been through our share of difficulties uh, that life has thrown our direction. And uh, we have processed those difficulties exactly the way I'm preaching it to you today because that's what the Bible teaches us. And I'm telling you that my heart is broken for those of you that are going through challenges that not only are life-altering but in some cases life-threatening. Because one of my strengths as a person, and that included before I became a Christian at 12, was God placed within me for all of my strong personality and I think you could call it leadership skills. Maybe some people don't. But for all of that, I've always been a sensitive person to the needs of people, always. Though I'm a hillbilly by birth with some Cherokee Indian blood in that, I never liked hunting. I didn't like, as a kid, carrying the squirrels on the stick, sharpened at one end to slip the squirrels there and upside down and the blood streaming out of their mouths and occasionally seeing that there was babies in the nest and my dad would have to just hit the little baby squirrels with a rock to kill them because he had just taken the mother. It's a human, hum, humane thing to do. It just, it's just never never appealed to me. I'm not one who likes to hurt people. I like to heal people. I like to help people. God has given me the strength to shoot wolves in sheep's clothing. That is not my desire, my nature. I simply do what any leader does. They do the hard things to protect the mission and the purpose and the responsibility that's been placed on you. So have I shot a few people, wolves in sheep's clothing? I sure have, and I haven't lost a bit of sleep over it's an interesting contrast to who I really am as a person, but the ability to do what God has said to do, and you just move on. Otherwise, you shouldn't be in the position. But we know what it's like to have our hearts crushed um, and, and the change that that can bring. Uh, and the, it's just tough. So if you'd stand with me here this morning, our prayer partners are coming. I, I want you to know that as we go through this series, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. That yes, there were miracles of Christmas, and we talked about that last week. But there were also struggles of Christmas that we've talked about today. And I know that some of you uh, will... This will kind of go over your head, not because you're not listening and applying, but you're not where some other people are. And everything I've said this morning is penetrating them deeply because they're there. They're in the real world. You know, we talk about going to heaven. We talk about all this, and it's right, and it's, it's got its place, and, and it's what we believe. But anybody who's honest with you will tell you that the number one instinct that we have is self-survival. We're made that way. And so when our life is threatened, there's stuff that happens that we have to process. 
And I'm telling you, I learned young not to take life for granted. I was only about, I believe I was nine if I go back and track it. I think I was nine. I might have been eight years old. I remember that morning well when my parents' best friends dropped off their three kids, our best friends, basically, to play and to spend the night while they went on a short trip overnight. She was a drop-dead gorgeous woman, 33-ish years of age, drop-dead gorgeous. We said goodbye. And for the next, oh, three hours, maybe less, we all played outside there in the mining fields of Joplin in the Chack area that I grew up in. And I remember being in the yard when the police officer drove up to our house and we all stood and looked and dad came to the door. It was a Saturday as I recall and dad came to the door and I saw the look on their face and then they turned to my friends. The oldest one was about 12 and then one 10 and then the girl that was our age, my twin sister and I's age and said mom and dad was in a bad wreck just 30 miles outside of Joplin your mom was killed I'll never forget that day and I can tell you other days I could give you other examples and I'm telling you that when I gave my life to Christ at 12 and when I started preaching I've never forgotten those experiences in life that brings pain I am a preacher today not because of the, just the eternal promises of God that are just invaluable to us all. But I'm a preacher today because I know that the power of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit working in our lives, that He has all the answers for the sometimes hell on earth we go through. And I am encouraged every day and for every Sunday with the opportunity to present to people all people but especially those on any given Sunday that are deeply disturbed and struggling that you are not like those without hope we have a God who loves us so much Marcia and I went through a, a thing this week where it looked like I had cancer. So the doctors rushed everything through, did a great favor to me. I didn't ask for it, they did it. But instead of being strung out until the middle of January, they rushed it through. Looked like that's what we were looking at. Don't know how bad, what's going on. And I'm a man of faith, so is Marcia, but we're realists too and you look at it and you say okay this, this would not be really good there's a lot at stake around here if you've been around here very long you know Marcia has a life insurance policy for her and her next husband to go off into Lululand so that wasn't a concern but the church and everything else and I want to tell you from Wednesday morning when they said okay we got to go looking for uh, cancer stuff here through Wednesday night then they called me quickly three hours later and said get over here we're going to fast track this get your blood work done we're going to do the CAT scan Thursday and then we're going to do the bladder thing Friday, uh, Saturday morning so I want to tell you and I know I've taken you over time but bear with me I debated whether to even to say any of this to you but I want you to know March and I processed it what if not because we didn't have faith in God. But just like Joseph said, okay, God, I only know to take everything to you. How's this all going to work out? What's the ramifications to the church and the school and the $45,000 a month payment we got to make, etc.? So we won't go through any more of that. But yesterday morning, 
before the 8 o'clock doctor's appointment, which our assumption going in was that we were only going to find out what kind of cancer and how bad. I was up early because there wasn't a lot of sleep going on. If you've been through it, you know that. doesn't mean you're not a person of faith, but you're consumed with, okay, I, I've got a lot of responsibilities, and God, how are we going to deal with whatever might happen? Because we're going to deal with it, God, in you. If that be where we're going, then you will guide us. So at 5 o'clock yesterday morning, I was reviewing this message. And I said to Marcia, now this isn't news to any of us, but when you go through things, a lot of times, it's like, you know, you, you never listen to all of those dumb commercials about, I've fallen down and can't get up. Push the button. Until you start falling down and you can't get up. And then you're listening to the commercials, right? And so... I said to Marcia, I said, you know, Marcia, when she got up about 6.30, I said, I went through the message this morning. And I said, it's very interesting how you read these scriptures and the truths when maybe you're going to be going through something you've never been through before yourself. So we went to the doctor at 8 o'clock yesterday morning, and we're expecting not good news, just don't know what it's going to be. Now, I know there's religious people that will criticize me, but they're wrong. Like the Bible teaches, we took our, what we knew, as best we knew it, we took it to God. So I, we went to the doctor, and she went with me. And those bladder exams are not fun. But the first thing he came in, he said, well, first of all, your CAT scan was clean as a whistle. Looked great. Wonderful. So he says, let's check that bladder and see if that's the problem. Because kidney and bladder was really what we were looking at. So I'm laying on that table thinking, okay, don't know where this is going. He goes through there and he says, man, I haven't seen a better looking bladder in all my life. He said, you're as clean as a whistle. Have a Merry Christmas. I want to tell you something. I, got, I had a day yesterday that was a lot better than I thought it might be. But I'm telling you, those are difficult times. I happen to have a good ending. Thank God. But Marsha and I process life the same biblical way, whether it's preaching to you or receiving it and having to do it ourselves. God will not fail you. He won't. And anybody who knows us very well knows journeys we've traversed and still traverse to this day. And we do it the same way that we've preached to you for 31 and a half years. Our God is faithful. So if you have one of those times you're going through in life, please follow Joseph's lead. Don't deny your situation. Take it to God. Be soft and tender to hear what he has to say. And do whatever he tells you to do, no matter how difficult it is. He will walk you through, and you will get to the other side you will have the peace of God, whatever the journey involves or even how it ends up. He will take you through it. So I'm going to close today with simply this. If you're not a Christian, I can only invite you to the one who loves you so much and who is faithful and true and can do the impossible. If you want to reject him, that is on you. Still to this day, people want to judge preachers by how many people receive the gospel. Let me tell you something. I'm not responsible for whether you receive the gospel or not. I'm only responsible to preach it. That's it. In our American culture, we lift up pastors in larger churches like we're something special. There's nothing special about me. I just preach the gospel. We happen to be in a place where God has said, I want to do a work, and God 
has saved people like you? Not me. So I'm giving you an opportunity to walk into the arms of the one who not only loves you completely, but will never leave you nor forsake you. No one else can make that promise to you. And if you're going through a difficult time, even if you have kids and children at church, they'll wait. I know, I know, that groaning in spirit. Yeah. So let's pray these altars are open. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the power of your word that you ordained to speak into our lives, to guide and direct us, to keep us steady as she goes, even when the burden is heavy. And we're processing that and turning it over to you. I pray, God, that today no one will leave this building without first coming to know you as their Savior and Lord. May they come and ask you to forgive them of their sins and surrender their lives to you today so that the rest of their journey on this planet Earth will be with the help of the one who created this planet instead of trying to do it on their own. And I pray for anyone who are here today whose hearts are really, really struggling, not with their faith, but with the journey. And that moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, and even at times, year by year, constant pressure. I pray, God, that they will come and that this will be a moment of, of tremendous peace in their life and direction. And even, yes, miracles. That you change the circumstances. You change the realities. And bring miracles into their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you folks. These altars are open.